challenging each each one of us to become personally engaged to work together to solve modern day slavery. You lead with vigor and tenacity to the advocacy you do. So again, let's give a round of applause for the group of people. Now we turn to our keynote address, Deborah Kanensky. Um, Deborah Kanensky is the executive director of Blue Sky Parada Survivalist Services. She is an entrepreneur who joyfully wears many hats that all accessorize each other beautifully in order, in order mm -hmm. to offer you potential clients, natural life altering improvements, and clarity of life purpose. She is a certified mental health practitioner who offers one-on-one -on -one personalized self-love guidance to those who want to thrive in life instead of survive. Because as you will learn today, if she can thrive in life, then so can you. Deborah is a gifted photographer, accomplished author, and seasoned motivational speaker who could have been a statistic of abuse, trauma, and addiction, but instead rose above adversity after learning how to finally love herself at the age of 39. Deborah is an adored wife, blessed mom, cherished friend, animal lover, advocate, and volunteer who happily calls Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, her home. Give her a warm round of welcome. Hello everyone. So just a little rundown um, of tonight's talk. We'll be talking about some kind of heavy topics as you know and some kind of light topics, maybe some horrible singing in between and then we're going to have a little bit of a fashion show. Um, I have provided everybody with some tissue on the uh, table there. If you need it, please use it. <laughs> I'll try to keep it as light as possible. But uh, as you know, um, we're here to talk about sex trafficking, and so um, I want to talk about my life and uh, how I came to stand before you today. Um, if you had asked me 11 years ago if I'd be standing in front of people talking about my life, I never would have believed you. I would have believed that I would probably not be here based on the life that I was living 11 years ago. Um, growing up, I was born into a family where my mother was mentally ill. She suffered from pres prescription drug uh, addiction. Um, she was also a prostitute. Uh, my father was a biker, uh, an outlaw biker who kept us on the move. Um, the last time I stopped counting at 33 moves that we had. Um, I grew up in a home filled with abuse. Um, my mother was very mentally abusive and uh, the topic of my talk tonight is actually the B word um, because how many of us have been called a B word? Any of us? Men? Men can be called B words too. Um, and it never makes us feel good and that was my mother's favorite word to call me. Um, she uh, was very abusive, um, physically and mentally, and um, so I started drinking alcohol and smoking marijuana and cigarettes at the age of 10, and um, that was what was going on in my house, and so I figured it was the best thing to do. Um, I was taught by my father and my mother that I basically had no worth other than what I had between my legs and that no one would love me um, because I was unlovable. And for a little girl, we don't know what we don't know, I believed them. And so my self-worth was not very good. Uh, take that into my teenage years. Um, so for my 16th birthday, um, my father actually uh, invited me to take my virginity because um, he thought that would be the best way for that to happen for me and um, thankfully I uh, declined him that evening um, but soon after gave it away to a boyfriend so that I didn't, wasn't forced into giving it away in my own home. I had already been sexually assaulted in my home um, twice by my older brother and by 16 I had already been sexually assaulted eight times. Um, take that a little bit further in life and uh, I started drinking more, doing more drugs, hanging out with the wrong 
crowd, trying to find um, someone who was going to give me some sort of validation or teach me that I was loved. And unfortunately, I fell into the wrong hands. As a vulnerable woman who um, had no self-worth and had uh, not a lot of um, support system, I, uh, I fell into the world of human trafficking. And it came naturally to me because um, my father, from a young age, uh, victimized me through child pornography. And once again, not knowing it was child pornography, at the age of 19, while I was in a nightclub, I had a gentleman who had been um, producing my photographs uh, in the photo lab at Superstore uh, try to sexually assault me in a club one night because he had seen my wares and he wanted to show me his. Um, Soon after that, uh, I had a friend who um, sort of helped me in that situation, and um, he had just started working at the bar I was working in, because what better place for a person to is, you know, drowning their sorrows in alcohol to work than a bar. It was uh, really easy access for me to get alcohol, and I was drinking on a daily basis to numb the feelings that I was having inside of unworthiness. and. Um, so uh, this man said, I'm going on a motorcycle trip, and uh, you're free to come. There's just one stipulation. And I said, what's that? And he said, you have to be sober. Now, I'd been drinking every day, all day, for a decade by that time. And so naturally I said, I need a new life. Uh, I need to try something different, so let's try this sober. So I quit drinking and smoking pot and cigarettes and uh, went on this trip. We left September 1st, 1988. And um, we got far away, enough away from home and he handed me a camera and said, oh, by the way, I promised my favorite parents you'd be taking, we'd be sending home pictures, so you get to take the photographs. And after being victimized by a camera for 19 years of my life, um, holding that camera was really, really traumatic for me. And I just want you to know, sometimes I tear up. They're not tears of victimhood. They're tears of gratitude because I'm thinking about where I've come from and the fact that I'm standing here thriving and able to share my story with you. So please know that these tears that come are very happy tears and tears of gratitude. Uh, so we went on this trip. Uh, I took the pictures and that's where I fell in love with photography. I, um, I was 20 years old. We went through 23 states, um, into Mexico twice. And I fell deeper into love with Mother Nature um, than I had ever thought I could in my life. Mother Nature, to me, was the only nurturing parent I had in my life. I didn't have uh, a mother figure who taught me the ways on how to be a girl. Um, I didn't have that loving presence. The only presence I had were the ants on the ground and the, the wind and the leaves and that was my only solace, was Mother Nature. So being able to travel through the, through the United States after this life and um, really um, grasp my appreciation for Mother Nature and everything that she provides for us. Um, unfortunately, when I got back from the States, uh, I had to move back in with my parents, I had nowhere else to go, and so my 150 days of sobriety quickly ended, and I started drinking full force again, because although I had changed a little bit, um, my family situation had not, and it was a very violent, toxic uh, environment for children to be living in. Um, I started drinking um, more and got even deeper into the sex trafficking um, 
I was in the clubs every night. I was hanging out with pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers. The only thing that differentiated myself is I never, um, I never became professional. Um, I was always the pimp's girlfriend. And so the pimp's girlfriend is always the one who gets the grooming the most. You sit in the front of the car, you get the drinks, you get the trips, you get all of it. Because they're grooming you uh, to get you to do what they want you to do, which is make them money. And um, so the reason that uh, sex trafficking is so important for me to talk about is um, because one night when I was 19, um, I was supposed to go to Calgary with one of my girlfriends. Um, and some of our friends, and um, something just didn't feel right to me that night. And so I told her I didn't want her to go, and she went anyway. And um, she was trafficked that night. Mm -hmm. They put a needle in her arm, kept her drugged for a week and a half, made her servicemen night and day, and then brought her back to Edmonton and expected her to live her life. That very well could have been me. Um, so fast forward, um, I was going to the clubs hanging out with pimps. Um, I uh, decided, went to the doctor, the doctor said have a baby because your body is failing you. Um, we, what happens when you deal with trauma is your body fails you. Trauma eats any goodness inside of you. And uh, unless, unless you heal your heart, um, there is no going back from that illness. And so I talked to the man I was dating at the time who, um, he was working as a construction worker, but after I became pregnant, decided that he wanted to become a pimp. And that was the conversation. I want to uh, become a pimp. I was like, seriously. So. Something inside of me, although my child was planned, decided to throw his stuff off the balcony that night and um, raise my child on my own. And so I did that. Fast forward five years, I had, um, had, an I had another child with another man. He was a good man, um, but he wasn't the right man for me. So um, through all of these relationships, there was sexual assaults and um, Things that we sweep under the carpet because it's happened so many times and nobody's listened the first times. So who's going to listen now? And that's why I'm here tonight is because I want to start the conversations. I've had people say, oh, how can you come out and start talking about how you live that sort of life? And I say I, t I talk about it with pride because I am alive. I'm here. And after 40 years, I found a voice that I never knew I had. And if I can encourage one person to come forward and share their voice for the better good, then that to me is a beautiful gift. Um, so um, as an adult, I was a functioning alcoholic. I was working up to three jobs at a time. I was living in government housing. I had two children. I was a solitary parent, not a single parent, because I didn't have, I had walked away from my parents because of the toxicity that they had in my life. And so I thankfully walked away from that situation and raised my children on my own. Um, my kids are now 27 and 22 and very successful and healthy young men. But at the age of 39, I, um, as I said, I was living in government housing, working up to three jobs, and I really had no direction because I still, at 39 years old, did not know that I had worth or value or any purpose in this world other than to try and find somebody who would love me through what I had between my legs. It was the only worth I had. Um, a girl in the neighborhood was going to school at the time and uh, she would call me all the time and say, 
hey, do you want to come over and help me write this report? And I was like, eh, I don't really like to, you know. I love writing and stuff, but I don't want to do someone else's homework. Um, and every time I went over the, and helped her go, um, she would come back to me and say, oh my gosh, I got an A. Like, thank you so much. I can't believe that. You know, I'm helping myself. You should help yourself too. And I was like, I'm stupid. I have a grade 9 education. How am I going to go to college? And she said, you should just go try. So one day I walked into Northwest College and uh, I took an assessment and found out I was actually kind of smart. <laughs> um, I had a, uh, my math was really bad, um, but other than that, I had a college level in reading and English comprehension, which to me, I'm thankful for reading books. Books as a young girl is my escape. Um, and so I would read stories and be in those stories to escape the life that I was in. So apparently some of that sunk in and I was kind of smart. So they said yes. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm smart. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go to college. That's not how it works. <laughs> I'm afraid that's not how it works. But I did it. Um, I jumped the gun and so then I didn't have a job for 18 months. Um, the I was told that there was a long wait to get into the college, and um, so I was dating a pimp at the time, and of course he offered me to help me. I can help you if you help yourself, just one day, $500, and no touching. I was like, no, no, no. And finally it was around Christmas time, money was really tight, $500 was looking really good, and so... I vowed to do the one thing that I said I would never do. And so I met him that day, the one next morning, and I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And he sang me a song. Would you like to hear it? I warned you about bad singing. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Debbie O, Debbie O, my ho, my ho, we're going to make lots of do, do, do. Wow. That was his song to me. Slap me right in my face. Me turn around and get out of this vehicle. I imagine my life had I gotten that vehicle. I would not be here. I know I would not be here. $500 is not enough for life. So here we are. I say no to the pimp. I've got another 12 months to wait for school. Uh-oh. <laughs> Where's the money going to come from? Well, it happened, so happened that the universe blessed me three days later. Um, someone in the college had fast-tracked my application and um, I was accepted into mental health rehabilitation course and uh, received a check for $1,500. My children and I had a great Christmas that year. They had food on the table and it was a gift, a gift. Three years later, I graduated from college from the Mental Health Rehabilitation Program with honors. And uh, something I never thought it would do. And a few months later, I stood in front of 700 people for the very first time in my life and told my story. Let <laughs> me tell you, <laughs> I've changed a little bit after that. Um, I still shake a lot when I talk, but I talk with a purpose because there are so many, no one is immune to sex trafficking. I had, I was on a conversation with a girlfriend the other day and she said to me, um, I said I was bringing my stepdaughter. And she said, oh, she's like, why would you take her? She's too old to be sex trafficked. I was like, my husband is a very, he's ex-military, he's a very burly guy stick a needle in his arm with something and keep him high, he could be sex trafficked. No one is immune. Anybody can fall victim to it under the right circumstances. Thankfully, I had something stronger in my brain that pushed me in the other direction, said no. And so I'm grateful to be standing here and able to share my experiences with you in hopes that my message can reach someone that if I as one human can 
live through all of these things and thrive and do all of the things that I'm doing now, imagine my potential had I found out that I had worth before the age of 40 years old. So in front of everybody on the table is my daily mantra. And this is my prescription to myself every morning. I wake up every morning and I have this on my bathroom mirror. I have it at work, I have it in my phone. And so if I could invite everyone to stand and repeat this with me, I would be ever so grateful. Ready? Please repeat after me. My mental health is important. I promise to love and embrace who I am today. I am beautiful inside and out. I have a voice and I will not be silenced. I am strong, courageous, and driven to succeed. I emanate love, gratitude, and kindness. I am better and deserve happiness. I promise to love and embrace who I am today. Tomorrow, I shall do the same. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. On the floor, to uh, if you have some questions for Deborah here today, she's given us. I would a love to get the conversation started. Does anyone have any questions? Who just wants to see fashion? <laughs> Were you just uh, still involved in the trafficking just in Edmonton, or were you maybe brought across provinces? We went to Calgary. We were back and forth between Calgary and Edmonton. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't know anybody who worked like normal jobs. Everyone that I hung out with was either a pimp or a prostitute or a drug dealer. That was just the life that I was in. It was, it, it's not something I'm proud of, it's just what it is. And I didn't know it was wrong because that's what I had been grown up to, was thinking was acceptable. I was, I was, it was acceptable for me to be degraded. It was acceptable for me to not, you know, not have any worth. These things were acceptable. And now I say, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for anybody to feel like they are less than phenomenal. It's not acceptable. Any other questions? Yes. I have a couple. For sure. Um, one of the questions I have is like lots of times when you think of trafficking, the, the, the thought of is more people being trafficked around different countries. But uh, one of the shows I saw not too long ago was saying that there's a actually high percentage of people trafficked within their own country. Absolutely. And so. I was curious as far as you can, what the percentage was. And the other question I have, which has been a little different, is as somebody, you know, like say in schools or different in the churches, what are some things that we can do to, to help or keep some other questions? In your situation, that one bit. I wish people had talked to me when I was a child. I was very, very introverted as, as a, I mean, f until I was 40. And now, honestly, now you can't shut me up. But, I mean, I was. I was very, very introverted. And so I just wish someone had asked me, are you okay? I just wish I, you know, someone had asked me because I, I, I think I might have had the wherewithal to know, to say, it's not okay. Something is not okay. But no one ever asked. It's topics that we don't talk about. And there's, I'm not sure, do you have numbers on what the, does anybody have numbers on what the trafficking is like in Alberta alone? James, would you have that information? I, really I mean. Don't like, you know, the thing is, <clears throat> with, you know, with, with our service, with, with Chrysalis, um, you know, I could get a lot of repeat calls. And uh, there are a few, there are, you know, a couple, couple in Alberta mm -hmm. and a couple in BC and but most of the other calls are coming from the states you know, Florida mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot that transit through mm -hmm. yeah. so they may be from Alberta but now they're in Saskatchewan or in right or in, exactly yeah. Uh, yeah. but it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of that in that circuit of 14,000 
Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, but they're, they seem to be reluctant to fill up the census forms. I know. Yeah. You're already getting numbers. You know, and the thing is, like, for, you know, I think you know yourself when you worked on the line. I did. Um, that, um, you know, like, you get the repeat callers, mm -hmm. but you never, you very rarely got a new caller. You know, like, you might get a, uh, you might get somebody from, say, Windows, and they are saying, hey, you know, you know, we have, we give your number to, you know, water, mm -hmm. right. or um, uh, somebody from, uh, from Covenant House. They mm -hmm. come up and give your, you know, it's, uh, you know, but right. the thing is, it's just really difficult when, when we're, you know, like, I mean, our phones should be bloody well ringing off the hook. They should, and I know very well that they're not. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like, I mean, I don't know how many times I've been thinking, okay, it's, uh, you know, I come on and I just ship it to six ship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll maybe I'll get a call and maybe I'll get two calls. I can sleep right through that ship, no problem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so how can we how can we get the conversation started, James? How can we get the number out? Well, because I know there's a lot of people that I've spoken to since I've worked with you on yeah. the line that they... There's a lot of people out there that don't even know that this exists. Yeah, There's well, so many people who don't even understand that trafficking exists. Like yeah. in Edmonton, yeah, yeah. they're like, no, it doesn't. I'm like, no. The thing is, with, with people, yeah. it's, it's always <clears throat> happening somewhere else. It's always happening in of another course. country. It's always it happening. Has, it in, has to be shiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was right. called in by a CTV in Saskatoon yeah. mm -hmm. right after the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls report was released. Okay. And they said, well, I was happy. I did a 45 minute interview with them, of which 15 seconds ended up on TV. Oh, wow. Because something shiny came along. Donald Trump did something ridiculous or yeah, whatever. Exactly. It gets dropped, and we, I, I don't know how to keep it. Well, I, in the I'm forefront. grateful that like, CTV just did a, a news piece on me. And normally, if you can get a minute for it, they gave me, me and my story four minutes. Oh, wow. Which oh, is four minutes. Four minutes. So out of three <coughs> hours of interview, mm -hmm. it was four minutes. And I, I mean, I'm not sure how many, if anybody saw the interview. It was very short. I mean, and it, I mean, it was in, in, it was action. You know, you know, like information filled and stuff. And it's getting the conversation started. But four minutes is not enough time yeah. to get this conversation started. <coughs> you know, and it, and it's, it seems to be, it's tied up, again, this is a battle we've been having for 15 years. Right. It's tied up with morality. Okay? The only morality that's involved here is this is abuse. Okay? Uh, our latest documentary, which is not going any kind of graphic details, cannot be shown on community television. Oh. Because it has the word sex in it. Oh, wow. Oh, come on. Serious. He's yeah. wow. been turned down by Shaw, uh, Sastel, wow. Bell, Global, all of them for, you know, just the, just the local community right. program. You forget about prime time or anything like that, but nope. Mm. Not allowed to talk about it in schools. You know, and, 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 you and know, that's where we need to be. be. Yeah. That's should be exactly part of the curriculum in grade yeah. six Absolutely. and seven. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, Absolutely. Okay. and the thing is, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I recently read a book uh, by a, by a former pimp, um, a fellow by the name of Carmen King, who wrote a book called um, uh, "Raised Raised in Pimp City," mm. and it is, well, it is, it makes you feel very uncomfortable, which it really well should, mm -hmm. and. <clears throat> um, but the thing is, he talks about what's happened since he got out of pimping, right? And like all of his, you know, all of his losses, all of the friends that he lost, simply from growing up. And and this is, you know, and this this fellow was uh, lives and works in uh, San Diego. Okay. And so if you, you know, if you. Uh, you know, if, if, you know, if you if you don't know a lot about about trafficking, then that is a book that you must read. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's wrong. It's upsetting. It's real. Yeah. 
Yeah. People need to hear it. Yeah. My question for multiple individuals here. Now, those who have worked the phone lines, if someone wants to call you saying they're stuck in human trafficking, what, what, what step by step, what does that person need to do to get safe and who do they need to call like step by step? I don't think there is a set protocol. I think every situation is different, oh, yeah. but, yeah. but I think James is on the lines the most, so he yeah. would have an answer. So, yeah, so best the that. thing is, um, you know, it, it's a matter of kind of getting the conversation, you know, as, uh, as, as Deborah was talking about, you know, getting the conversation started mm -hmm. and, you know, having people uh, understand just what, you know, just what the situation is. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I have dealt with um, uh, young girls. I've dealt with, um, you know, women who were who were trafficked and have gotten out. And uh, you know, I keep telling, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I basically want to know their story. I want to know what is going on for them. How are they? How did they? How did they get out? How did they survive? How did they? You know, what were their strengths that you know that that um, you know that uh, that got them out? You know, and what what kind of resilience are we talking about? Like, you know, that's basically what I'm looking for. You know, because the thing is, we can tell, we can we can just you know just kind of sit on a problem and deal with the problem all we bloody will want. But unless we start looking at solutions and finding out what what drives what drives these people to keep themselves safe. And like that's you know, and in fact <clears throat> I'll tell you about one one case that I had. Um, young lady this is a lady who, this is a young lady who I've been working with since she was 16. Um, she called me one night and she told me, she told me her story. And I thought, oh my God, but how have you been managing since? You know, what's, what's the thing that's getting you through each day? And she said, that she's in school, and I said, "Okay, so how is school going?" And what, well, I've got an 88 average. Right? Say that again. <laughs> and she, you know, and she said, "You know, I've just finished. You know, I've just finished with high school, and she was still being trafficked at this time." And. Um, she also, you know, once once she got thank you, once she got her, um, um, you know, once she got her um, her diploma, mm -hmm. she had five universities bidding for her for scholarships. Mm -hmm. Two were athletic, three were um, were uh, academic. So I thought, oh God, this kid's on the way. This kid's going to get, thing, things are going get, to get good for this kid. Mm -hmm. She contacted me four months ago. And she said that she was, that she'd been trafficked again. And I thought, shit, she had everything going for her. I asked her, well, how did that happen? What happened? And she told me that, you know, that uh, she was struggling in school, and, you know, and the pimp approached her, and you know, she got into it. And, <coughs> and uh, you know, but now, you know, but. She said that, you know, I'm really working on things, you know, getting things right, and I'm going, you know, I'm, uh, I'm volunteering at Covenant House, and, um, 
you know, I'm also getting my meals there, you know, a lot of times. And so I said, okay, well, that's good. And so then she called me up. Um, Wednesday. She's crying. I've never heard anybody cry before. And she's telling me that she, you know, that this pimp has approached her and she, you know, she's going to go out and I said, listen, here's what I need you to do. I need you to call me when you get there. I need you to call me when you're done. I need you to call me to let me know that you're back home. And so, I, you know, I, you know, like she called me at 8.30. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to, about that time, I was just going to go to bed. But, and I didn't get much sleep that I, um, I was awake until about 4 to 1. Phone rang, and it was and it was this young lady. And I said, "What happened? You know, you were supposed to call me." She said that her pimp took the phone. And I said, "Okay, you made sure you know was your phone locked? Did you give it to him locked?" She said, "Yeah, because my phone number was on there." And um, so, um, so anyway, so. Um, you know, the pimp approached her again and I said, listen, here's what I need you to do. I need you to give me your name, your full name, your address. I've got your phone number. But I also like your pimp's alias and his phone number. She says, I'm not comfortable doing that portion of it. I said, well, then give, give that information to somebody you trust because it, you know because if anything should ever happen to you that's the start. So uh, she's been in touch with me um, uh, a couple of times since and she seems to be doing much better. So mm -hmm. I'm sure she has all of her prayers. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the signs that we as a community can watch for if we, to kind of recognize maybe if we don't? Wow. Well, good question. <laughs> well, boy, the areas are telling you. There's, there's places where things happen. It could be anywhere but like things happen. Usually, and, 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 and you can drive through there, walk through there, yeah. and just talk. You don't have to be doing anything or yeah. we just talk to people. Yeah, and you know, say good morning. Yeah. We have a we have a Tim Hortons on twenty second street in Saskatoon. Um, and a giant tiger in the same apartment lot. Giant tiger's trying to move. You know, it's pretty bad with giant tiger. Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, if you pull to that kid's parking lot and you back your car up against the, the curb on the street side, then a girl will be there in about 10 minutes, within 10 minutes. If you back your car up to the Timports itself, the drug dealer will be there in five minutes. Mm -hmm. it's, they're all signals, and it's just you can see it. And you can just go, oh, I don't want to see that. You can see right through it. Um, you have to make, make, make the perpetrators aware that you're watching them. Um, without pissing them off? Without pissing them off too yeah, much, you know? Them off, yeah. But because they'll, they either, you know, you, you can separate or they'll take care of the girls. Too. Absolutely. Um, and, and make sure the girls know that uh, she, I know, it's, I know, I'm know. i sorry to sound like to you. How are you doing? I don't really think there's any, like, personal care characteristics, though, that a person could watch for. Um, I would think, I mean, I just think of myself. I was very introverted. Um, I, I didn't make eye contact. Yes, those are the kind of signs that, yes, 
I, I think I'm aware of. Yeah. So yeah. The signs are very similar to domestic violence. Speaking. Yeah. 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 Right. It's Eyes down. Uh, yes. Lack of hygiene in cases. Yes. I got teased a lot while I was growing up because I wore my brother's clothes. Um, I was told I smelled like a, a like pee. I mean, we grew up in abject poverty. Like we used to go to the dump and find our stuff that we were going to be using that week for like clothing, or we would collect bottles. I mean, like the dump was our grocery store. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> the, uh, like abject poverty. I don't ever remember, um, I mean, I, I see people who eat squab now, and I'm like, hey, I used to eat pigeon too when I was little. <laughs> Didn't really have a choice though. <laughs> you know, not knowing I was eating a delicacy now yeah. for people who were eating squab, but yeah, we used to raise pigeons yeah. so that we could eat pigeons, because we had no food. The, the police have a very good comprehensive list of things to watch for. Oh, for sure. <clears throat> These are things they missed, you know, I, I know cops who are, who are to this day haunted by the four girls in, in light summer clothing in the back of a car in the wintertime. Uh, he had pulled over for some minor traffic thing and let them go. And they, were they had been trafficked, you know, and it's just like he didn't recognize the signs. So hotels have been are being trained in it. Uh, airlines, mm -hmm. the airline ambassadors and the group like that, mm -hmm. and the police have excellent lists. So if you want, they'd, they'd be happy to share it with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? yeah. Getting back to this gentleman's story, like I'm not even all of this. Um, so when the girl phoned you crying and sobbing, could you not direct her to the police? Like, isn't that well, the thing? Well, the thing is, you know, I can mean, like she knows the police are there. I've only told her. Told her about, you know, that she should be up to the Vancouver Police Service, the Human Trafficking Union, mm -hmm. and you know, talking with them and. charge against you know against your pimp that's the place to start you know because the thing is as long as you've got the, you know as long as you've got support that's you know that, that really helps you know and uh, <clears throat> I mean she has I mean I don't know how many times I've talked to her you know since the first time she called um, she'd often call up and just say, hey, James, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm, I'm okay, okay, fine. So what, you know, so what else is there that I can give help with? You know, oh, I just want to talk. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Sometimes when you have no one, yeah. any yeah. random voice will do. And my, I myself was taught that the police, you didn't go to the police. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's more mental. It, I think it's more of a right? mental thing. I mean, it's That's grooming. It's we, conditioning. We, yeah, it's absolutely I mean, conditioning. Yeah. Years and years none, of... None of these people had a needle put in their arm and then sort of came down and went, well, I'm on drugs, I might as well turn tricks. Mm -hmm. They're, they are conditioned yeah. through the abuse, through the addictions, through all kinds of things mm -hmm. to, to believe themselves to be worthless and there's no way they would ever turn in their pimp. Never. I mean, these people are experts at... at their pimp, they the love their yeah. pimp. Yeah. You know, their pimp you know. is their provider. Yeah. So you, you can walk up to one of these, these people and say, Okay, uh, here's a house for you to live in. And we have a job for you, and we have this money right every month, and you can live here. Like, no. Can my pimp come? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, whatever became of the people, uh, the one who gave birth to you, and the sperm donor who uh, was responsible for helping you get along and coming into this world? <laughs> so, my mother still lives in Edmonton. Um, she and I do not have a relationship. Um, uh, she's still mentally ill, um, and she basically tells everybody that I'm lying. Um, I know I'm not lying. Uh, and the man who was my sperm donor, I found out actually when I was 25, is not my biological father. Thank you. Um, and he passed away um, in 2011 to prostate cancer. And that was the day I had a party. <laughs> Yeah, I had a really big party that day. Yes. Uh, I volunteer for an association called Changing Together, a center for immigrant women. Mm -hmm. Many of the women are legally brought into Canada, but this is one one of the um, group that we help so much. Is all the internet 
foreign mail order brides, yeah. mm-hmm. legally brought to Canada. But once they're here, and, uh, and we're not really saying that all the men that really come to pick no. up the women from other countries are not really truly in love with them, but many make use of this being a legal way of bringing in women to really bring them in. And so one of the women that was brought here thought she was going to have her honeymoon. Sure enough, she was nicely dressed and so on. Mm-hmm. There were 10 men waiting for her. Oh, oh my gosh. It was not the man that brought her in. Now, many times from you know, Fort Mackay or from any other places here in Edmonton or in, in Alberta would call our organization, Changing Together, and would say, how will we come? How will we get out of it? Because they have, my husband has my passport, everything. There's no way I can get out of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were able to save one girl by saying, okay, dress up, um, put your clothes in layer, go to church. I'm sure he will allow you to do that. Mm-hmm. And there will be one of us that's going to be taking you, and that was out St. Paul area. Right. area. So we were able it's to bring bad. her out from there, and then brought her here to Edmonton, and brought her somewhere else for safety. And we have quite a few places for the women, shelters, like Wynn House and Lorena and many others that really help us. But the thing here is, every time we try to help, I have been um, threatened many times on the phone. Josephine, what are you doing? Go back to your country of origin, which is the Philippines. We bring all your poor women here. That's why we marry them, to give them a chance to live. And I'd say, That's yes, right. thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. But please don't do that again. Yeah. 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 And so that's one. And one thing is also arranged marriage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not consent. It's not. And once the woman comes in here, it's abuse. Mm-hmm. So again, that's another kind of a woman that's brought in legally, at the same time, trafficked in many ways. Mm-hmm. How can we let the government know? Write letters. Conversations well, like we this did. is the start. It's a start. And it's so difficult for the women also from the third world countries not to say, I'm in love with this 85-year-old man right. or this young fellow yeah. with uh, Lexus behind him as his car and so mm-hmm. on. Or a 90-year-old man that said, I love you so dearly, please come. She came to Edmonton. Yeah. The man was in a senior home, a bachelor suite. Right. Again, she said, what am I going to do here? I thought I was coming here to help also my relatives back home. Mm-hmm. How can we help human trafficking? See, yes, As a group like this, here's we the thing. go into that. The recent immigrants are the ones who are brought over illegally or legally, but are not Canadian citizens yet. The 14, 15, 16 year old Serbian trafficked, they don't vote. You want something from the government? It has to be people who vote, who ask for it, because they don't care about anything else except getting the votes. And that's all of them. That's not any one party, that's all of them. So they can't vote. Women you are helping don't vote, but we can. I mean, the politicians are collecting the taxes off of the rub and tugs all over the the country. And they know it's going on in there. They have to know. They're collecting the taxes from those buildings. They know what's going on there. But because they're getting their pockets lined, Business. Oh, massage, uh, massage parlors. We Sorry. Did, oh, did you? Yes. <laughs> Made them all legal. You had to get a license. Right. And then the bylaws. <laughs> so then there was no more warrant needed to go in and raid the place. You just do this prize bylaw inspection. Wow. We've got three left out of like almost 30. Wow. And I guarantee you're not going to get a happy ending in any of those. Good. Because they're, they're, they may be crappy massage places, but that's all they are. That's why we have to deal with some of the stuff, but you right. need a, a united front on it, and unfortunately we don't have one on this. We can talk about this more later, but it's, it's, sure. mm-hmm. we, don't have, we don't have a united front on, on a direction on things, because too many people conflate trafficking and, and what was, was being called legitimate sex work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. That legitimate it sex is. work drives our courts. Mm-hmm. The trafficking is the problem we have, as long as these two are linked, you'll never fix it. Anyone else? I just want to say one in four 
in Alberta are men that are trapped. Absolutely. Yeah. No one is immune. No one is safe. And it's not just sex. It's no. Example in Edmonton. Uh, an advertisement was made to men come. There's a construction job for you. I need 30 men. They arrive. He says, well, I only really need 15. But let's see which one of these are going to work better. So he puts all of this men, all of these men to work for a week or so and says, he slowly starts to weed them out. And at the end of the month, oh, he promised that there's a, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, LMAO, uh, Labor Market Opinion, on this job. And so by the end of the month, he's down to 15. But then the last week he says, oh, the Labor Market Opinion didn't come through. It's a form of slavery. The men worked for nothing, got nothing out of it except for work. All the money. If there's uh, no more questions and conversation, mm -hmm. thank you for bringing me. Thank you. Um, also, she does have her designs. She's actually doing it herself. I've asked her about how she got started, but uh, it was through comments and kind of seeing whatnot. So we are also we don't. Um, so she is actually uh, selling her designs, and she is going to have a, a mini fashion show. So whoever's her models, if you'd like to come up and. Uh, get ready for the show. So we're going to take a 10 minute break so you can finish uh, bidding so that we make sure all these items are bid on. Make sure bid on, uh, we need to have all these items, uh, um, uh, we need to receive bids. And before we take a break, I'd like to uh, call up on Timothy. He has uh, a brief PSA right now. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting across from Deborah. She told us so I'm going to ask her to help me to tell you that every year she gathers bags mm -hmm. with all kinds of materials that she gives out to people over Christmas when she goes caroling in different parts of the city. So Deborah, would you please tell us about that? Absolutely. So this year will be the fourth annual um, Helpful Handbags campaign. Um, I collect handbags throughout the year for the inner city community. I have um, dentists and vendors all over the city who um, provide me with feminine hygiene products. Um, so basically I ask you to clean up underneath your sinks. So any feminine hygiene products you're not using, um, any toothpaste. We all you go to the, ho the hotels and use the little sample size soaps that we think we're going to use but they end up under our sinks and so I ask you to declutter give that stuff to me I put it into bags for the homeless um, community and we go to the mustard seed around the middle of December we sing Christmas carols and we hand out the handbags so if you're interested in becoming a helpful handbag I am having an open house at my home where I'll be baking yay uh, <laughs> on November 30th from 10 to 4 it's a drop-in if you want to come drop off donations or if you want to fill a bag, uh, if you want to write a note for, because um, we put little handwritten Christmas cards in every one of the bags. And last year we actually had um, a donor come forward and give us uh, $205 gift cards so that um, even though um, some, of the, the, some of the men didn't get a helpful handbag, they were still able to go to Tim Hortons. They were able to get a scarf, a toque, a pair of mitts, and uh, something warm to put in their belly. And so yeah, we'll be doing that um, hopefully the middle of December. I'm still waiting for a call back from the mustard seed to get a date for that. But I would love to see you then. And it's a lot of fun because Christmas carols are fun. Okay, thank you, Deborah. <laughs> thank so, you. Uh, while we have our 10 minute break of doing our bids, we also, we come back, we're going to do our door prizes draws. So don't lose your tickets. So 10 minutes, desserts are coming around, but make sure that you also bid on the selling auction. Thank you.